Coming in at number five, we've got SCP-007. Oh yeah, this is a good place to start. SCP-007 dates all the way back to 2008, before a lot of the SCP protocols and practices we're familiar with today were even a pipe dream. No one could have predicted how huge and popular the Foundation would grow to be, especially when a good deal of the anomalies were like this. Not to say SCP-007 is bad, it just doesn't have the creepy viral potential or the wild sprawling storytelling of some of the more popular new entries. Right, so I should probably focus on the task at hand. SCP-007 is also known as the Abdominal Planet. That's not the name of a cheap core-centric gym, it's actually a pretty accurate description of the anomaly. Somewhere inside of one of the Foundation's many facilities, there is a man, and this man is missing most of his abdomen. Skin, muscles, bones, all missing. But he doesn't seem to be particularly negatively affected by the lack of essential body parts. In the negative space here, there is a sphere composed of water and soil. Kinda just floats there, like one of those globes held up by magnetism. He's not bothered by the fact that his midsection has been replaced by a miniature planet, in fact, he just regards it as a fun little oddity, like if he had a birthmark shaped like a butternut squash, or a scar that resembled Gordon Ramsay. Homie just chills out at the Foundation site, playing chess with a doctor regularly and otherwise just lazing about. The thing is, this planet in his body is a near-perfect replica of Earth. Well, sort of. Geographically, it's actually pretty different, but stuff like weather, gravity, and technology all seem to line up pretty well. The Foundation has discovered two intelligent species on this tiny abdominal planet, but hasn't managed to communicate with either as of yet. And if we were going to take a guess as to how far along these creatures are, scientists guess that the tech on the planet is at around the 15th century level. So maybe it's for the best that we don't reach out as giant sentient overlords quite yet. We don't want to blow too many tiny minds. The thing is, nobody knows how fast these little creatures will develop. What happens if the dude with the planet in his abdomen dies? What if the tiny planet denizens discover space travel and colonize bits of the outside world? Is shrinking people and sending them to explore this uncharted world an option? Only time will tell, I suppose. Morty, you gotta flip them off. I told them it means peace among worlds. How hilarious is that? Coming at number four, SCP-686. Uh, I'm not so sure that I want to talk about this one out loud. It's, well, it's milk. Like, you'd be hard pressed to find more than a couple minor differences between this substance and regular milk that you could get at the grocery store. Yeah, sure, there's a few extra vitamins in it, and it causes people to become human cows, but otherwise, it's pretty normal. Wait, what? Oh, yeah, I guess I should elaborate more on that bit. So, this milk is by most measurements indistinguishable from regular milk. However, if a human drinks this stuff, they begin to develop an enormous udder at the front of their body. It starts off with their regular milk-producing organs getting larger and producing more of 686. If they're regularly milked, this is as far as it'll go. However, if you're not up at dawn every morning like a good farmer should be, the milk mutation will develop further. Over the next little while, the affected individual will find that they're developing little fleshy spouts all down their front, which will eventually swell and shift into an enormous set of udders. Just like a cow. Yikes. If the mutation is allowed to progress to this point, it won't just be physical similarities any longer either. The affected individual will start to act more like a cow, too. People under the influence of 686 are said to be more docile and dead-eyed than other humans. They'll just wander around waiting to be milked, and they'll produce 40 liters of the stuff per day, too. Good lord. And there's no going back, either. Once you drink this milk, you are in it for the long run. Folks at the Foundation have tried to surgically remove all of the flesh produced by the addition of udders, but it'll all grow back in due time. And if they do excise all of it, the person in question will be back to their milk-making ways relatively soon. For now, the Foundation has just tried to keep all this milk under wraps and all the folks producing it penned up somewhere. Most people would think that's the best course of action, but there are some Doja Cat and anime fans who might think differently. Coming in at number three, we've got SCP-279. And here I was thinking that I was done with especially questionable SCPs for the day. Don't get me wrong, the top two on the list are weird, but I don't feel as weird talking about them. Funny how that works. Right, so SCP-279 is a plastic vibrator. For the purposes of this video and a generally PG presentation, we'll assume it's like a magic wand, you know, meant to massage tense muscles. The inner workings of this device are incredible, as it seems that the normal electric motor one would expect to find has been replaced with a tiny nuclear reactor. The first three of four settings here are low, medium, and high, none of which really need nuclear power to get going, but there is a fourth option, 
labeled suicide. And that's where the extra oomph is needed. Crank it up to 11 and you can disintegrate stuff. It'll vibrate so fast that whatever it's in contact with will lose structural cohesion. You know when Thanos snapped and people faded into dust? Yeah, this handy little machine can do that too. It was found after descending through 30 floors in an apartment building and liquefying whoever was using it originally. I don't know how they got their hands on it or why they would turn it up to suicide. It must have been one hell of a muscle cramp. Coming in at number two, we've got SCP-1233, Moon Champion, Champion of the Moon. I love this guy. Every four or five years, a humanoid in an old school spacesuit shows up somewhere. This usually means he'll come crashing down from orbit, destroying plenty upon impact with the ground. Once he touches down, Moon Champion will head towards the nearest small town. He won't take a direct route though. He'll meander his way towards that little bastion of society doing weird things along the way. He'll inspect farm equipment, chase insects, attempt to greet small animals, try to eat plants, and inevitably give up because they won't pass through his helmet, and more. What a charming chap. Once he makes it to town, he'll do his best to convince everyone he's there to help. However, his superhuman strength and poor understanding of human socialization means that Moon Champion usually ends up destroying some stuff and upsetting some people. Walking into traffic causing collisions, smashing through glass storefronts to inspect items for sale, stacking parked cars like the world's most expensive Jenga tower, and collecting dogs as currency to purchase more dogs are all examples of strange and fascinating Moon Champion behavior. All in a day's work, right? He'll also try to explain his duties as Moon Champion, but he never ends up making any sense. It's pretty funny to hear him try though. All in all, if you want a really funny SCP entry to read, this is the one. Just make sure you read the security footage log and do your best to find all the tales. Moon Champion knows how to adventure and party. Huh, wow, that's incredible. What the heck? Morty, do you realize how ridiculous that sounds? Yeah, pretty crazy story, Morty. Are you serious? And finally, at number one, we've got SCP-4233. The arrival of SCP-4233 was like the announcement of a spin-off of one's favorite show years after it was canceled. It's definitely not the same thing, and it might be a little late, but it still brings some of that elusive joy to the table. We talked about Moon Champion today, now get ready for Sea Champion. Oh yeah. Another impenetrable suit-wearing humanoid causing well-meaning destruction on his mission to do god knows what. Absolutely legendary. This time around, our champion wears an old-school diving suit. Think Big Daddy from Bioshock. Thankfully, he's a little less aggressive on average, just as destructive though. Every once in a while, Sea Champion will emerge from the sea and begin to walk in a straight line towards another coast. During this walk, he will have no regard for the world around him. He'll walk straight through obstacles like logs, parked vehicles, walls, and more. However, it seems as though he will do his best to avoid trampling civilians and large plants. Nice. When asked what his mission is, Sea Champion claims to be looking for his brother. Can you guess who that might be? If his brother needs help fighting monsters on the moon, then he'll help him. Otherwise, he'll request help to fight the beasts at the bottom of the sea. Like a big, bloody, bestial family reunion. Coming in at number 5, we've got SCP-2678. This one is known as the Vor Hole. Let that sink in for a second. Interestingly enough, this SCP is no longer available on the wiki proper. You have to find the archived page to read about the Vor Hole. The current 2678 is a strange copy of an empty cathedral with an organ sitting in the middle, but the original is much, much stranger. Hopefully I don't cause any problems by bringing the OG Vor Hole back into the public eye. Ready for some weirdness? Because... I'm not. So if you're driving around the southeastern states, you might find some telltale signs of this SCP. Billboards on the highway will suddenly display new advertisements, ones for places, products, or experiences that don't exist. However, the legitimacy of the ads doesn't really matter, as anyone who sees one will be compelled to pull over and get out of their car in order to search for SCP-2678. Near these billboards will be a busted up old structure, maybe an abandoned roadside motel or a shack from the pre-highway days. Either way, the billboard ciders will feel like they have to enter this space and will find some sort of entrance. The entrance acts as an access point to a spatial distortion which leads to SCP-2678. Folks will then find themselves in a big weird cathedral of sorts full of caustic air that quickly degrades any and all biological material. In the center of the room, there is a pit, and at the bottom of this pit, there is some sort of entity. People are drawn towards this hole, throw themselves in, and then are swallowed whole by 
the creature in there. Yikes. To make matters even weirder, folks affected by this tend to express odd increases in body temperature and libido. So they get all riled up and then they get swallowed whole by a monster. I guess that's what some people are into, but to be forced off the highway and lured into something's belly doesn't exactly sound like a rational choice. There's a quasi-religious and pretty cult-like organization that supports this anomaly and they believe that if enough people are consumed by the thing in the hole, their goals will be completed. So extra creepy, extra weird. For now, just avoid tourist traps altogether. It's never worth it anyways. This way you avoid spending any money on cheap trinkets and you also don't get drawn into a weird cult consumption craze. Coming in at number four, we've got SCP-919. Mirror images and doppelgangers are a staple of mythology across the world. There's nothing creepier than coming across someone who is exactly like you, but separate from you. It's unsettling, uncanny, and unpleasant. Naturally, folks have some reservations observations about mirrors as well. If the person on the other side started acting out of turn, what, what are you supposed to do with that information? Just pretend it didn't happen or walk around the rest of your life with the knowledge that there is some other version of you trapped in a reflective surface, in all reflective surfaces. If you agree that mirrors can be truly creepy under the right circumstances, SCP-919 is going to weird you right out. It seems to be a full-length mirror in excellent condition. However, if somebody stands in front of it more than 15 seconds, their reflection will break synchronization and act of its own accord. It will beg the person not to leave, which is fraught with implications. This mirror person will seem to be totally autonomous and fully self-aware. Its memories will be the same as whoever it's reflecting, but it also knows that if the person leaves, it will cease to exist. If said person moves to a spot where the reflection is no longer visible, their reflection will scream and disintegrate. Sounds painful. Worse yet, if the person returns to the mirror, their reflection will also return, and then also seemingly have knowledge that their doppelganger knowingly let them experience that disintegrating agony. Continued exposure to this mirror has been proven to be detrimental to subjects' mental health. Seeing yourself beg for your life and then hearing your own screams of agony as your double disintegrates will do that to a person. All in all, it's a good thing that the foundation keeps this hidden away from the public. Here's something even weirder. If the original subject dies while in front of the mirror, the mirror image does not perish. In fact, it'll request that you leave the body behind so that it can continue to exist. But once the corpse is cleared, the disintegration will happen anyways. Grim. Coming in at number three, we've got SCP-1728. Headless Butter Man. Need I say more? Probably not, but I will anyways. This greasy, dairy-filled freak is a very weird case indeed. See, it's a headless humanoid without the ability to speak, but it can still perceive and interact with the world around it as any other human might. It's got the mind of a child and is able to write using this ability to communicate with the Foundation personnel. Pretty weird so far, but that is just the beginning. SCP-1728 is constantly exuding a substance chemically identical to unsalted butter from its skin. If you wipe it away, more will be produced. This makes SCP-1728 very slippery. The butter will stay on its body until it brushes up against something, and the butter will wipe off onto that object. And at the ends of its fingers, it has hollow bone points that also exude butter. These can be used to write using the butter, and as low-pressure butter jets. Now, Butterman doesn't like being in containment. He used to have a cast iron knife that didn't slip from his grip, but the foundation has locked it away. So Butterman does his best to avoid being contained and the slipperiness helps him a lot with this goal. He can squeeze out of most restraints thanks to the butter and can even slide around at speeds up to 34 kilometers per hour. It's like a butter frozone. For now, the Foundation has a series of procedures that seem to be able to keep 1728 in place. Cold helps to keep him still, and for whatever reason, polyurethane works better than all sorts of other materials at preventing slippage. Personally, I would be stoked to have a butter-producing friend, but he did stab a person before being contained, so it might not be a healthy friendship. Coming in at number two, we've got SCP-093. Now here is another SCP involving the misuse of mirrors. That's not all that's notable here, but it seemed right to mention it. While the SCP itself isn't a monster, if used correctly, it opens a gate to a world filled with some of the scariest monsters this side of 682. 093 is a disc carved from a material resembling cinnabar covered in strange symbols. It will change colors based
based on whoever's holding it, although it's not really known what each color means at this time. The thing wants to be on a mirror, and if you place it somewhere that isn't reflective, it will roll until it finds its way onto a shinier surface. At that point, if somebody makes contact with the disc, they will begin to move into the mirrored surface, and if allowed to continue through, will find themselves in a brand new place. Depending on the color of the disc, the subject will end up somewhere different. In the alternate world, something has gone terribly wrong. Folks have discovered that a hyper-religious sect took over for a while, and a new godlike being began rewarding those it considered clean of sin. In order to fight a holy war against some really horrifying beasts, the godlike entity granted humans some wicked technological advances, ones that ran on a strange religious substance known as His Tears. Unfortunately, this substance also had great corruptive power, and turned a lot of folks into the very monsters they set out to purify. The unclean, giant humanoids cut off the legs. They crawl around absorbing people into their bodies, and really that's just the beginning of it. Thankfully, the Foundation has the disc contained, so hopefully nobody's making any unintended round trips into this alternate world. And finally, at number one, we've got SCP-504. Remember that movie, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes? Well, these are definitely one type of killer tomato. They look and smell and taste just like normal tomatoes, and if, you know, nobody ever made a bad joke, they'd actually be indistinguishable from your garden variety fruit. But terrible humor is a hallmark of humanity, and therefore these tomatoes are deadly. Anytime a bad joke is made in the vicinity of one of these tomatoes, they instantly accelerate to a speed of at least 100 miles per hour towards the source of the sound. That is one quick sandwich ingredient. It doesn't matter what condition the fruits are in, you can have them sliced, whole, smashed, etc., but the pieces will go flying towards that joke, and the results are messy. A nice mix of blood and ketchup, and sometimes it's hard to tell apart. Apparently the harder the person telling the joke is trying to be funny, the faster the tomatoes will move. So leave your worst best joke in the comments and we'll see if any of these tomatoes come flying in for revenge. We've got SCP-789. Why don't you have a seat right there? It might be an old meme, but Chris Hansen has managed to immortalize himself as a finder and destroyer of online predators, and good for him. But what if I told you that an SCP has been quietly continuing his work for years now without making a TV show about it? You'd think that this kind of thing would deserve some more time in the spotlight too, yeah? Well, here we go. SCP-789 is an entity that exists in a North Dakota home. The house looks like your classic suburban two-story. Three bedrooms, a couple bathrooms, nice kitchen, all the good stuff. If the house is granted internet access, 789 will manifest as a desktop computer controlled by a pubescent child. It will then spend a good amount of time using online chat rooms and talking with adults all over the United States. Through this correspondence, it will create all sorts of stories and characters in order to gain the trust of these adults, who usually have questionable motives. It often has dozens of conversations going at once and does a bang-up job of keeping track of all the details. Eventually, the adults will be invited to the house. If one decides to pay their online child friend a visit, they will find said pubescent kid hanging out alone in the home. They'll be invited in and usually the house will be done up in a pretty inconspicuous way. Once comfortable though, this individual will be set upon by 789 in a different form. Non-human components will appear and do something that has been redacted, which results in the chat room predator being turned into a fine slurry. The entity then absorbs that fine slurry, leaving nothing behind. It'll vanish at that point, remaining mostly hidden until it decides to bring someone else home. Apparently, it takes care of the house itself by spawning two adult humanoids to do the chores and entertain any guests. But the main function is to lure in online weirdos under false pretenses and then turn them into that nutrient mush. I'd like to see Chris Hansen top that. Dateline. Coming at number 4, we've got SCP-426. This entry reads very strangely, especially considering the general format for writing up containment procedures. Most of the time, they're written very impersonally, third person, clear instructions with opinions and interjections kept to a minimum unless an addendum of some sort is added. But 426 is written in the first person, as if the narrator is the anomaly. Here is how the first paragraph of its containment procedures is written. Hello, I am SCP-426. I must be introduced this way in order to prevent ambiguity. I am an ordinary toaster, able to toast bread when supplied with electricity. However, when any human being mentions me, they inadvertently refer to me in the first person. Despite all attempts, there is yet to be a way to speak or write about me in the third person. When in my continuous presence for over two months, individuals begin to identify themselves as a toaster. 
Unless forcibly restrained, these people will ultimately harm themselves in their attempts to emulate my standard functions. There's plenty more written throughout this entry, but that's essentially all you need to understand what's going on here. You can't refer to it in the third person for whatever reason, and if you live with this toaster, you're gonna try and be a toaster. Seems kind of funny, right? But holy smokes, this doesn't end in laughs. The original owners of this household appliance all died in tragic ways. One person gorged themselves on kilograms of bread, causing their stomach to rupture. Another died from electric shocks received when she attempted to devour an electrical socket. A lone survivor was found extremely malnourished, claiming they had inserted two pieces of bread weeks ago and were waiting for the toast to pop out. Those are indeed toaster behaviors. The foundation has done more tests on how this bread browner affects folks who spend time near it and have found that the self-identification as a toaster effect was a lot more powerful than the other behaviors. Although folks who are influenced by the toaster don't tend to notice what's going on even after it's too late. You know, maybe it's for the best that you pan toast your bread from now on. That way you get a nice crispy edge and avoid death by appliance emulation. Coming at number three, we've got SCP-2598. Sometimes the sheer audacity of salespeople can absolutely stun me. Their ability to hawk their products, even when nobody seems interested, is a true testament to their force of will. They'll try to spin anything to make it fit people's lifestyles, and that kind of on-the-fly thinking is pretty impressive. But in the case of 2598, it's more like on-the-moth thinking. <laughs> I crack myself up. But wait, there's more! SCP-2598 is a traveling moth salesman. You heard me right, folks. For the low, low price of three easy payments of $19.99, you can have a moth helmet of your very own. Call now and we'll explain to you how this anomaly is a small moth wearing a helmet that communicates with people by flying into their head, eventually tapping on messages in Morse code. What's that you say? You don't know Morse code? No worries. The moth helmet also allows the moth to understand spoken communication from humans, and you can let them know your payment information quickly and easily. You'll be the talk of the town in no time with a moth helmet. Buy some for your moth friends. They'll love you for it. Makes an excellent stocking stuffer. I don't know if I could do this salesman thing. Coming at number two, SCP-1867. So first off, this is an anomalous version of a really cool non-anomalous creature. Do me a favor and search up a variable neon slug. I did a project on snails and slugs in elementary school, so now whenever they get mentioned, I have flashbacks of doing that research in the library. But just look at this thing. It is neon, and that is natural neon coloration. I love it. 1867 is extra cool, though, because it has telepathic abilities. It can communicate with folks within five meters of it and identifies as Lord Theodore Thomas Blackwood, British explorer and naturalist. Good for him. While telepathically communicating with someone, this slug speaks like a 19th century British dandy and tends to be pretty friendly. This is one smart slug, as it seems to have in-depth knowledge of all sorts of areas of study, ranging from zoology to linguistics to more obscure topics like cryptozoology and mysticism. Apparently he's made all sorts of discoveries in these topics too, which to be honest, seems a little far-fetched. However, the Foundation took him up on his offer to share what he's found and followed his instructions to an old manor. Within these walls was a treasure trove of artifacts, containing hundreds of previously undiscovered specimens ranging from plants to animals to evidence of unknown societies. After finding all this and being understandably floored, the Foundation reached back out to Lord Theodore Thomas Blackwood with some questions about how he came into possession of a lot of these things. After implying that he might have forged some of the stuff, the Foundation also let it slip that he was indeed a sea slug and not a famous explorer. To which Lord Blackwood responded, Good heavens, boy, have you been drinking? That's utterly ridiculous. If you can't be bothered to be sensible, I have no reason to speak with you. Go get yourself a nice cup of tea and sober up. <laughs> Maybe someday we'll find out what's really going on here. And finally, at number one, we've got SCP-2682. This is what appears to be a purple raspberry attached to a sheet of flypaper. It communicates telepathically in the Slovak language and causes unpredictable things to happen when people physically interact with it. Apparently it can only be seen from certain angles, and when microscopically investigated, it seems as though there is only empty space where the fruit should be. Back to the unpredictable things, it has been observed turning a man who touched it with his finger into spaghetti, replacing a D-class subject with a croissant when he used a rod to touch the fruit, and shifting another individual into the shape of a squirrel. Upon further investigation, it was learned that this thing was from a far-off place in the universe, where a much more advanced civilization once existed. 
The entities that comprised the society were desperate for new knowledge, as they had already learned everything they thought they could. While looking for this new info, they experimented with the occult, found God, and started playing with the rules of the universe. Eventually, they felt the only thing left to do was harvest knowledge from other dimensions, which is how this raspberry ended up here. It forced itself into our world, fell through limbo, and somehow found itself attached to a piece of flypaper. Because our world is so simple compared to what it has been doing, it finds it impossible to free itself from the sticky grips of said flypaper. From that point forward, the Foundation interviewed this berry on the nature of many things, from time travel to God. All well and good, but not too useful to us in our dimension, unfortunately. Then, after making a profound realization, the entity started to take rudimentary human form and disappeared entirely. Haven't seen it since.